They hit something um, at night um, about 100 miles south of Jamaica. And um, they think it was a log. They never saw it. Uh, they start taking on water uh, really hard. And um, after about three hours of trying to rescue it, they had to abandon ship. And uh, with my dog, because my dog, um, uh, I wasn't able to get her the papers to fly into Turks and Caicos. Um, so three guys and a dog bailed into one of those inflatable rafts. And fortunately, there was a freighter nearby that um, rescued him. That was Perk Perkins describing a crazy period during a year-long sabbatical. Perk and the Orvis story today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you're new to the podcast, stop right now, click subscribe uh, in your app of choice. Whatever app you're using right now, just click the subscribe button. Hammer that subscribe button. This will assure that you get the next episode delivered right to your phone. Perk Perkins, previous Orvis CEO, describes the family story of how they built Orvis into one of the leaders that it is today. We find out who were some of Perk's biggest influences over the years, how the 50-50 movement got started, and what scaling back means for the future of Orvis. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. OPST's rods represent decades of dedication to sustained anchor two-handed casting. These rods are a true illustration of Skagit Master Edward's vision. The Micro Series comes exceptionally close to single-handed specs and is proving to be a unique tool for trout and smallmouth anglers alike. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to get started right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash OPST. Sawyer offers a full line of modern and traditional products for oarsmen, canoeists, kayakers, and paddlers from all genres, providing unsurpassed function, performance, and beauty. The Sawyer Artisan Oar is their very popular square top oar with carbon fiber X weave fiberglass shaft reinforcement, featuring prints of fish species from artists around the country, passionate about fisheries and fishing art. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to grab your set today. That's Sawyer, S-A-W-Y-E-R, to get started right now. Lots of good stuff today uh, from a, a cool guy and, uh, and a cool story. So without further ado, here is Perk Perkins from Orvis.com. How's it going, Perk? Good. Good morning, Dave. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks for coming on here. This is this has been pretty fun. I've got some some co- cool questions. I've uh, connected with Tom and some other Orvis, uh, some some big uh, influencers in the Orvis space. But I want to touch base with you today because obviously your family and your connection there over the years. Um, so as we get, let's just start this off with your fit. You know, just take us back to how you first got. I mean, I'm sure your dad, you know, pr- probably got into fishing. But talk about when you first knew about fly fishing. You know, it's my grandmother um, really gets credit for kind of the introduction of fly fishing in our family. Um, she and her she and her husband um, kind of had reverse roles. He was really big into horses. He was in the cavalry um, and his dad was a huge horse guy. Of course, when his dad was alive, that's that was the means of transportation. Um So my grandpa was into horses and my grandmother was really into fly fishing and wing shooting. And uh, while they would do those things together, I guess like a lot of marriages, they'd probably do a fair amount of them apart. And so my grandmother, being a a woman, often uh, fishing alone, she needed a she needed a passport to go to a lot of places. And my dad became her passport. Um, because she, she, yeah, she wouldn't be allowed places kind of by herself. It was just too weird. Um, so she introduced my father to fly fishing and really she introduced me to fly fishing. I remember going to her over to her house, um, on a Sunday afternoon and I was probably six or seven and her teaching me to fly cast on the on the lawn um mm-hmm. and i remember her taking me on my first trout fishing trip um so she she was still a a, a big influence um, um in, in her older years yeah um but initially i grew, I grew up in ohio and uh, so initially it was um, bluegills and bass you know on shoeman yeah. crickets and poppers and things like that 
Okay. And, and and your grandma now is that Mary Orvis? No. Her no. name was um, her name was Catherine Perkins. Oh, right, 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 right. Hey, sorry, sorry, I'm confusing. Yeah, yeah, Perkins. I've 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 tied you guys down to the uh, Foley, but you are, I mean, you're only a few generations or a few owners uh removed, right, from the original. Yeah, I'm not sure the listeners kind of really quickly, the Orvis family, Orvis family started the company back before the Civil War. And it's really only been in three ownerships for what is that, 100, over 150 years. Um, it was the Orvis family, and then a, um, a couple by the name of Corcoran. They had it for about 25 years, and then um, our family, the Perkins family, has had it since '65. Um, so no, I'm not a direct, I'm not a direct descendant of Orvis, but we do have a direct descendant of Orvis working in our rod shop. Oh wow! Yeah. Amazing. Okay. So yeah, th this is cool because I mean, that's really amazing right there, right? Mary Orvis. I always think when I think of Orvis, the beginnings of Mary all because of what she did and then, all, and then your grandmother, right? And then you also have the Orvis 50, 50 movement, which is another thing you, you are all, you know, leading on. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but I just want to touch to start us off. So, so that's where it came to be. And your and then, so your grandmother, and then when did Orvis, so in, was it 65 when you guys uh, purchased it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So 65. And that would have been your dad that, uh, or how'd that work to describe Correct. that really quickly? Yeah. Yeah. That was my dad. He would have been in his late thirties at the time. And, um, it was a small company, a uh, mail order company. Um, it only had one store sold to a number of, um, they didn't even call them fly shops back then. I think they call them sports shops. Um, but that was, um, 1965 was before small computers were available to small businesses. It was before, it was about the time credit cards were first showing up. Hmm. So in, uh, my dad's biography talks about how, um, he really bought it at the right time because all of a sudden computers could manage mailing lists. People could buy um things with credit cards you know um over the phone and uh so he really really drove the mail order side of the business hard when he first got it because of those technologies that's right that's interesting so so basically your dad got going and then he ran and then when did you did you take over in the early 90s or how did that work yeah i joined the company in 1977 um uh, pretty much fresh out of college um and kind of worked in every branch of it possible. And then in 19, end of 1992, um, I was made the president um, <clears throat> a little against my will because I really <laughs> enjoyed the product areas I was working in. But my dad was uh, ready to fish and hunt even more than he had been, which seemed impossible <laughs> to me. And so, yeah, he sort of headed off, <laughs> headed out the door and I was left with the reins in my hands. Um, and my go. brother, my brother, Dave was, um, uh, a, a super partner um, for these many years since then. Gotcha. And, so it was you. So it was you and Dave basically running, or from the family running the company. Early. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. And were there other family members, other brothers and sisters that were out there not not connected? Um, I have two sisters, and each of them had um, you know a year or two um, in the company, working in one um, area or another, um, and um, didn't decide not to make it their sort of their life work, career work. Um, but they have, they definitely got a taste of the business. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And what were the, when you, before you took over as president, uh, what were the products you were really enjoying working on? You know, I was, uh, Gore-Tex, uh, oh, Gore-Tex, yeah. Gore-Tex hit the market, like kind of the, my first week of work in 1977. Hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, and we worked with some of the very first, uh, uh, employees from the W.L. Gore company who were first, you know, taking the product into the outdoor industry. That was, so that was really exciting back then um, with the Gore-Tex. And then, you know, all of the fly fishing products um, were, of course, just of great interest and passion to me. Um, mm -hmm. Reels, rods, leaders. Um, I suppose I can't really pick one above all the others. They were all you know, fly lines, they were all really, really interesting to me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you guys have had a ton. And you still continue to 
to launch new item. I mean, I think of one, the Spay Rod, I think recently that's been a good product. I mean, when you were there between the 90s and I guess running the show there for 20 years or so, you know, is there one product that really sticks out as a game changer? I mean, I know you guys had a lot, but does anything come to mind as a big one? I think the advances in in the carbon fiber technologies um, were yeah. certainly the most interesting. They took the most R&D um, involvement. They were actually some of the most challenging because, as you may know, the fishing rod industry is almost a byproduct um, to the aerospace industry when it comes to carbon fiber technology. So we get we get sort of the remnants of the, of the technologies that have been developed for the larger industries. So getting you know getting the attention of the manufacturers and the carbon fiber suppliers with our relatively small orders um, that takes that takes a lot of relationship work. That's right. And is that something, I mean, for yourself, is that something you you kind of prided yourself on being good with the relationship stuff or do you enjoy that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell it a fun story on relationships. Um, Jim LePage, who just retired, but was with us for 30 some years, um, was one of our key product developer guys. And there was a year when um, cork uh, platform shoes had taken off. And we could not get quality cork for our rods. Um, it, I mean, we could get this kind of crummy cork that you had to fill a lot. But um, and so we asked Jim, we said, Jim, we got to get some cork. So he went over to Portugal, where it all comes from. And he went and visited the three major cork suppliers. And he said at the end of the week, he was empty handed. He, they all just told him tough luck. He was out to dinner with one of them the last night. Um, they had uh, had a nice dinner and they got talking about foosball. And it turns out Jim loved to play foosball and the family loved to play foosball. So that you know, after dinner, late at night, they invited him back to the house to play foosball. And he sealed the deal <laughs> on the cork <laughs> nice. probably one o'clock in the morning after a foosball match. That was, there you go. That was, so relationships are, are God, as important as technology. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's perfect. Okay. Well, I mean, there's so many, you know, ways I could take this and, you know, the challenges with only an hour trying to dig in, you know, we can't get into everything. So I wanted to keep it focused and we are going to touch a little bit on the fly shops and, um, and I think the 50, 50 movement, but I did see a note. I think you might've sent this on the email, but the most underrated fish, I always love to dig into a topic that is kind of, you know, more, a little more specific. And I wasn't even sure which I have a couple of guesses, but do, do you have a, a species in mind or is that a few species that are underrated? I have two that I'm a huge champion of, um, the smallmouth bass and the uh, barracuda, um, I think are, yeah. and, and, and there are a lot of them. I mean, they have their share of fans, um, but I don't think most people realize what great fly rod fish they are. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, let's let's keep on just for this. We've talked a lot about salt, both you know, fresh and salt. But I've actually got uh, Mike Schultz coming up soon, who's also a smallmouth uh, expert, and I and we're gonna dig in there. So let's think as we're going moving through this. I might touch on a little, some smallmouth questions for you as we go, and maybe that relates to to Orvis and what you guys do. Um, but yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to go back to that the fly shop thing because you know what I think is really interesting about you guys are, you know, supporting the local, you know, I grew up around a, a small, really small fly shop and, um, and you guys supported it, right? We sold Orvis and we were not very big. And I always thought it was cool. I didn't realize the company you guys were then, but can you speak to that? Do you, I mean, how, how do you, what, what's your take on the fly shops? And even when they're really small, maybe they don't have a ton of money. How, how do you guys support those shops? I'll start off by saying um, the, uh, the, Fly shop in America is a miracle of modern retail because when you think of it, what other retail store can you go into where you're going to get the care and attention? I mean, they're going to show you how to tie the knots. They're going to spool your reel for you. They're going to give you a map of where to go. They're going to give you. I mean, yep. you don't get that. I mean, even in small bakeries and stuff like that, you don't. They don't invite you back. You say, here, let, let's make these muffins together and stuff. And it's it's really, it's just extraordinary service, um, extraordinary quality retail that you get in these fly shops. And it's because they're run by people who are passionate about the yeah. about the sport and um, they just want to help people. So uh, 
we we have so much respect for that chain of distribution and we know it is the lifeblood of the sport without that um a lot of people would never get proper introductions into yeah. the sport um so we we support it obviously with with sales reps and just being very mindful of what they what they need to make a living it's a Retail doesn't have big margins in it, um, and it's a it's a young man's game. It's a it's a mm. dawn to dark um, mm -hmm. game, and so we we just give them all the support we can. And one of the big things we you know try to help them out with is inventory. Sometimes you don't have enough. Sometimes you have too much, and we try to help you know them balance their books when it comes to inventory. Um, but uh, I think suffice it to say, we respect that the, the fly shop in America and around the world with um, as just a very, very key part of the business. Did you see that? You know, I mean, we had the big, obviously, 2008, you were around for that uh, period. I mean, I know a lot of fly shops went uh, down. Do you remember that that period? How, how was that for Orvis and the, just the industry? I do remember it. I and. Uh, of course, I remember it. Yeah, it was it was devastating. Um, we had to do a big right size um, to make things work, and it was uh, it was a painful time. Um, I don't remember exactly what we did at that time to help the fly shops. Obviously, we were and had to be more tolerant on sort of the accounts receivable. You know, the bills didn't mm -hmm. get paid on time, and we had to be uh, much more tolerant about that. And um, I had to help yeah. them out with inventory, to, uh, take some stuff back, um, provide credits where we could. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was a yeah. really rough time for for uh, the fly shop business. How do you become uh, the Orvis endorsed shop? That's something you guys have had going for quite a while. And did that start up um, with uh, your family, or was that going beforehand? My dad started that, um, and we what did we call them? We called them. Uh, I think we called them full dealers at the time. And the full dealer uh, relationship was more or less a pledge of allegiance um, that we would be, if not their exclusive brand in, in Fly Tackle, we would be their dominant brand, brand in Fly mm -hmm. Tackle. Um, way back then, you know, there was the industry was not as fragmented and, and diverse as it is now. Um, and so it was it was a little bit more logical. As the fly fishing industry expanded and got more and more suppliers and products and things, it, be, it did become a practical way of running the business because you, the fly shops really needed multiple brands and multiple suppliers. And we couldn't be a one, you know, a one supplier uh, fills all. So those, that full shop contact um, has expired over the years and it's involved into different forms of relationship. Hmm. The other thing you referred to as the endorsed program, yeah. and that that um, refers to lodges, outfitters, and guides, where um, we have created a relationship where one we find them of you know sort of top quartile service um, and quality, and then we support them through marketing, um, endorsing mm -hmm. them with our brand, and then. Mm -hmm. I think that helps a lot when customers are looking for a guide or an outfitter to choose from. If they see this one's Orvis endorsed, then, you know, they probably need to make fewer reference calls and check yep. with fewer people. So it helps them get to a decision when they're trying to find a new guide or outfitter in a new area. That's right. That's right. Cool. And, uh, and you, you know, your dad obviously was a big part. He was the, the kind of the person that got this thing going. I mean, when you think back, I'm sure you learned a lot from your dad, but is there one thing that really sticks out in, in all the, you know, focused on the, the fly fishing and the business side of, of Orvis from your dad? Well, yeah, of course there are a, a ton of things, but yeah, the one that sticks out was um, running the business by putting your feet in the shoes of the customer. Um, mm. that, yeah. Looking at everything yeah. you do from the eyes of the customer, not from the eyes of the, of the business. Um uh, and boy, that, that makes just all the difference. And so many times you see situations where decisions are made for the benefit of the business and to the, to the detriment of the customer. And it, oh, um, it breaks my heart and aggravates me when I see it, but we try never to do that. 
Sawyer offers a full line of modern and traditional products for oarsmen, canoeists, kayakers, surfers, and paddlers of all genres, providing unsurpassed function, performance, and beauty. They design and handcraft every product in the USA, ensuring everything they make is from the highest quality materials with careful attention to detail. They take pride in their employees, stewardship of the environment, and our country. In return, you have the assurance of knowing the product you receive from them is genuine, made in America, and cannot be replicated. I've been using Sawyer products for a long time now, which is why I'm definitely excited to share them with you on the podcast here. I've been down some crazy technical whitewater and mis- uh, mini fishing adventures that put me in places that were um, where I had to make a good move. And I, I love the design, the power, the performance, and always knowing that um, I can count on that stroke, even when you need to make you know that one to get past the rock or whatever. You can always count on Sawyer for that. And you can count on them as well. Sawyer products are designed by paddlers, oarsmen, and surfers alike to fully meet your performance needs. Pick up one today and experience the feel of water. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to grab your set today. That's Sawyer, S-A-W-Y-E-R, wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to get started. Okay, now back to the show. Yeah, no, that's right. That's And I think of this, I mean, that same thing with this podcast, right? I'm always thinking of the listener right now who's listening to this and how do we serve them something. And I think for me, I think the history of Orvis is interesting because you you have been such an influencer and, you know, there's a lot of companies that probably can learn from what you have all done over the years, including, you know, like we noted the 50-50 movement, right? That has been a big, a big part of uh, a big challenge and a big part of what, what is going on right now. What, how did that start? Did, did, did that start during your time? Yes, it did. Um, yeah. And it, um, the, the idea, you know, had immediate traction within the company. That's not an idea, really. It's it was a, 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 an evolution of of awareness. Um, one one of our endorsed guides, I think, deserves credit for making a quantum leap forward in that area. And uh, probably had to be twenty years ago. Lorianne Murphy. Oh yeah, was it, you know her. Oh, she, yeah, we just had her on the podcast. Okay, well, sure. She created Real Women and, you know, all all women guides, um, not necessarily for all women clients, but they specialized in bringing women into the company. But by by making, by putting a lot of hero guides out there as women, I think it really raised the image of the sport to women. Um, when the heroes are women, that, that makes a big difference. Um, so she... She deserves a lot of credit, and we mm-hmm. gave her a Breaking Barriers Award a few years ago for for her early work on that. Um, but ever since then, we've we have tried to find ways to bring down the barriers and to make it more um, inviting and uh, receptive for women anglers. Um, and yeah. in the fifty fifty campaign, Steve Hemkins, who worked for us, I think really took hold of that a few years ago, and and he set the fifty fifty sort of slogan, and yeah. and pulled the team together, um, which he not being a man, not a woman, he's no longer involved mm-hmm. with, but he um, helped kick it off, or was key in kicking it off. And um, I just want to say one of the one of the um, sort of interviews comments we got back early on, you know, we were, we got all sorts of comments as I'm sure you do Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of negative um, and um, some positive, but one of the ones that really opened my eyes to the subtleties is a college student um, who was a keen angler um, out of Cheyenne, Wyoming. It was commenting how she said, you know, I wish I could just go into a fly shop and ask the people behind the counter, like the guys do, just, hey, how's the fishing been? Yeah. Women can't do that. There's, you know, it's like, well, of course they can do it, but they be looked at like, who are you? You know, you know, you have no right, right to ask that question. And so little subtleties like that are are big barriers. Um, and so by having an all women group sort of steering this for us, it really helps us get at the at the subtleties. That's awesome. Yeah. And there's, and since then there's now there's United women on the fly. There's some other great women's groups that are out there. And, uh, yeah, I love digging into it, um, for a number of reasons that I've talked about here in the past, but it's interesting. Yeah. Because 
I mean, you're able to take a stand, right? I mean, Orvis as a company, you're privately held. And I know Tom, when he was on the podcast, noted this. I'll put a link to that show. But, you know, the fact that you're private, you can take a stand. It's kind of similar. I almost look at it as like Patagonia, right? I mean, with Yvonne, you know, Chinar doing his work where he just says it's the right thing to do. You know, we should do this. And, and it sounds like you guys did that. Is that, I mean, how did, is that how you look at things like issues like this and conservation that you just take a stand when you have to? I'd say more and more so. And I'll give um, my son's generation, Steve Hempkins, Simon Perkins, Charlie Perkins, Hannah um, Perkins. I'll give them credit for for taking the more bold steps. I would say we, in my generation, we were a little more all-inclusive, a little more timid about offending um, the mm -hmm. customer base. Um, uh, and uh, Yvonne was, of course, a huge inspiration in that area. But it was really, I think, this the, the current generation that's running the business that really was more bold about that. This is the right thing to do. We're prepared to trade out some, some of our customer base for other customer base by doing what we think is right. And, um, you know, of course, we never want to offend anyone. But sometimes when it's a when we really feel it's an important move for the for the resource or for the industry. Um, yeah, we're doing it now. That's yeah, that's amazing. I think again, you're just kind of leading out there, and it's a it's a way for the other companies to to you know to follow and do some of the same stuff. We um, and there's been a lot of great movements out in the fly fishing space. There's um, one I just recently interviewed um, a Bucky from the Fly Fishing Collaborative, which is this really you know really impactful program. But um, you know, he talked about how he's doing that because he thinks obviously it's the right thing to do, but a lot of other people are going to learn some great things they can do. I mean, have you seen other companies, other businesses following your lead out there or even your sons now, their their lead of what they've been doing? Or do you think that's a a goal for you guys? We want to encourage other businesses to to make the steps for sure. Um uh, we're being a larger company. I think we can take more chances, um, you know, um, and um, but I think I, I still think more women guides um, are are one of the keys because they really sort of set the tone up high in the industry. They build the respect, you know, at the right level in the industry. And, I, and that's where we really encourage our outfitters, our endorsed partners to um, to try to bring on and train and, and add mm -hmm. um, women guides to their programs. This is really cool. Well, um, I think, Perk, I th you know, obviously, like I said, there's a bunch of ways we could take this. I, I did want to dig, you know, a little bit into some of the people that we've heard. You know, I've got Phil uh, Monahan, who's going to be coming on soon, and, you know, Tom Rosenbauer's. But, uh, I mean, when you were through your phase, when you were there starting, I guess, was it 1977, right? So you right. had a, a good chunk there. I mean, are most of the people that are there, I guess now you were part of that process, right? You saw them come come and go. I mean, who who is, other than Tom and, and uh, Phil, are there a bunch of other people that have been there for years that we, we maybe haven't heard about because they're not on the social media? There are uh, most of them have retired or are at retirement age. Tom and I started within a year of each other um, oh, wow. back in the mid seventies. Um, and Tom's, I think the same age I am, I'm 68. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately he hasn't retired. Yeah, that's right. Wow. He's going to be leaving. That's the, that's the struggle. What's Tom leaves. How do you fill that guy's position? Oh, he's, 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 he's a, you know, he's a wonderful educator and so inclusive yeah. and stuff. So he's got some, he's got some, some um, men and women uh, coming along who are, are who are doing really admirable work um, in his same field of communications and education. So, um, yeah. but I, I admire the guy so much. You know, it's you know, we're old guys. We're supposed to not have new ideas. Uh, Tom comes <laughs> up with new ideas all the time. So yeah. I just love the fact that. Being one of our most tenured employees, he's coming up with some of the freshest ideas in the business, and that's so unusual. That's great. That's great. Yeah, he, yeah. I mean, this podcast. I told Tom when he came on that this he, you know, you guys, you know, inspired this podcast. Part of it, you know, getting this going, and and now, you know, we're approaching three hundred episodes, and uh, you know, it's been one of those things where that's what it's all about. You know, finding your passion and, and kind of digging in. So. 
So it's been cool to see. I think, you know, we did mention the smallmouth bass. I don't want to miss that because I know people are loving some, you know, hearing some tips and tricks. Do you want to dig into a couple of uh, like your background on smallmouth fishing and, and talk a little bit about maybe how we can help somebody find a few more fish out there? Well, I think what I'm, um, you're going to have a much better expert speaking to your listeners on this topic. But I, I think the, the, the thing to understand about smallmouth is unlike largemouth, they eat all the time. Largemouth eat once in a while, and then they go and digest. And the moon's got to be right, and the barometer's got to be right, and, so, and then they'll, they'll turn on. But smallmouth are eating smaller things, and they're feeding all the time. And that's what makes them a great fly rod fish, um, is because they're like a trout. They're they're eating pretty much all the time, mm-hmm. and they'll eat small things. So you don't have to have big. You don't have to throw big, you know, honking flies yeah. and stuff. You can throw smaller flies, um, <clears throat> and then they're. About the, about the hardest fighting freshwater fish there mm-hmm. is. That and the peacock bass, their cousin the peacock bass are both just amazingly tough fish. So I think the fact that they that they they just their eating habits are so much more agreeable is is what puts them on the radar screen. And then they're just, yeah, they're just a wonderful fish. Yeah. I I, I heard you talk, I think it was on another podcast where you mentioned going on a long sabbatical. I mean, obviously you're on a, you're on log sabbatical now. You could probably go do a lot of things, but what what was that? Was that mostly a saltwater thing where you took some time off of work and went on a extended trips like that? Yes, um, I took a year off in when was it 2012, and um, and with a catamaran and a bonefish skiff that I um, I bought secondhand, or I had the skiff built to go on to the catamaran, and I uh, bought the catamaran secondhand, and then had it uh, fitted up by some people in Fort Lauderdale to make it a kind of a bone fishing machine. And, um, so I basically left Fort Lauderdale in like October of 2011 and came back about a year later. I took the, I took a few months off during the hurricane season, but I went down as far as Honduras. Um, and you know, all along, the coast of Honduras and hmm. Guatemala, Belize, Mexico, around around Cuba, the Bahamas, um, and uh, and I basically just wow. bonefished for the whole whole year. Stayed in shallow Our water, so avoided the deep water as much as I could. Um, yeah. And I've always loved living on a boat, loved living at sea. Had my um, only full time guest was my Labrador. And then uh, <laughs> I had a, I had my you know family members and, and friends come and stay for me a week at a time. Um, and it was it was a wonderful experience. I, um, oh, wow. Yeah, this is this is amazing. So now describe for somebody that doesn't know much about the boats and stuff. So you're talking about you, you had a big uh, like catamaran, like a sailboat. So you're just kind of sailing yeah. your way down there. Yeah, yeah, it was a, a catamaran is a double hull, very wide, um, stable platform. So it was a 46 foot um, sailing uh, catamaran, had a 24 foot beam, had a lot of uh a lot of room in it and being a catamaran you don't have you have very shallow keels on them you don't need the deep keel so you can get into mm-hmm. shallow water um so i would i would anchor in five six feet of water a lot of times where i could get you know closer to flats and things wow um, the waters i wanted to fish um wow. and uh, i had you know a fresh water maker on it. it had it was solar powered for energy i had a um satellite um uh, communicators. So for emergencies, I could, I could reach uh-huh. out to, to people. Um, I did a blog from it too. Um, oh, wow. And yeah. Um, can you find that? Can you find that blog anywhere? I think you can. Um, I'm sure. Sh- yeah. Cool yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe try to find a link and put that there's in the some, show notes. So we can, there's some yeah. pretty good stories on it. Uh, what, what was that? Was it, were there any close, uh, any close encounters or why did you stay out of the deep water? Is that just because of rough seas? Well, they, um, the, the, I think the, almost the final blog post was, um, it, it sunk. Oh, really? Yeah. You, you actually <laughs> sunk it. Well, I didn't sink it. I was in oh. Honduras. I just finished a, a, a really great trip and I was headed up. It was toward the end of the year. I was headed up um, to the Turks and Caicos to fish with a, um, a friend up there, Willie Valley. Um, and, uh, I looked at the weather patterns and there was going to be like a week of pretty strong winds right on the nose of the boat. And I wouldn't be sailing. I'd just be pounding into the waves for motoring into the waves 20 for literally 24 seven. That's no fun. 
Um, and I'd hired a crew member um, who was a captain to do shifts with me. And he was two days from flying into Honduras to join me for this um, long crossing. And uh, I got smart and I said, um, see if you can rustle up two other crew members because I'd like to fly up there and just meet you there. Um, and which is what he did. He posted something online. He got a couple people <laughs> literally overnight to join him. And I just love it. You know, I just see picture this guy looking at his computer and said, hey, honey, you know, I've been trying to build uh, hours for my captain's license. Look at this. I can go to Honduras. I can get like a whole <laughs> week of sailing. Oh, yeah, sure, honey, you could do that. And then the next thing she knows, she's in Colombia having been rescued by a freighter. You know, oh, wow. see, but they hit something um, at night um, about 100 miles south of Jamaica. And um, they think it was a log. They never saw it. Uh, they start taking on water uh, really hard. And um, after about three hours of trying to rescue it, they had to abandon ship. And uh, with my dog, because my dog, um, uh, I wasn't able to get her the papers to fly into Turks and Caicos. Oh, yeah. um, so three guys and a dog bailed into one of those inflatable rafts. And fortunately, there was a freighter nearby that um, rescued him. Holy cow. So that boat sunk to the to the bottom of the ocean out there. They they're kind of neutral buoyancy, but it was declared oh. sunk by the by the Coast Guard. But it, um, I, I found out actually from uh, uh, an angler um, that it had been retrieved by a fisherman. He'd found it awash, um, went back with a bigger boat, towed it back to Honduras, and uh, family pumped it out and cleaned it up, and they're living on it. They're not using it as a ship, but they're using it as a, an, an apartment. Oh, wow. Isn't that cool? I'm just, I love <laughs> the cool. fact that it's, yeah, it lives on. So, so, so what I'm just curious for my own curiosity, what does a boat like that cost? If you could kind of get that, that boat that sunk. Yeah, I bought it for about 320,000 and uh -huh. I put almost a hundred thousand into it, um, in terms yeah, of the solar and the, um, yep. yeah, solar and water makers and all the doodads. It's kind of like you're buying a, you know, a house or whatever. Sort of be thing. like, a, yeah, it'd be like a nice, you know, a nice camp up in the main woods somewhere or something like yep. that. Probably. Yep. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Cool. Well, that that's an amazing story. I guess, yeah, like I said, we won't have time to dig in, but I'll put try to find a link to some of the uh, the the uh, blog posts you have there. That's that's pretty awesome. And bone fishing. So on that trip, did you have some pretty good fishing? Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I reckon I caught a thousand bonefish that year, and 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 I think I caught forty, almost fifty species. I remember wow. I was hoping to get a spe um, the equivalent of a species per week, fifty two, and I think I got to about forty seven or forty eight. Um, on it. so yeah, it was, uh, yeah. it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. What was the most common species other than the bonefish you caught out there? Was there one that you were catching a lot of, or you're you probably targeting bonefish. So maybe you weren't getting a lot of random. I was targeting bonefish and, uh, I suppose my most coveted, um, was a big mutton snapper. I never got a big mutton snapper. I got mm. them up to about three, four pounds, but I was, you know, hoping to get a 10, 12 pounder. Never did. I had a couple, a couple rushed the fly and never connected with them. Um, so yeah, that was my kind of, that was sort of my Moby Dick. And, um, I think barracuda was probably, um, probably my second most common species. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you know, you, um, you catch a small one on the flats. They are awesome eating. They're really good eating. Fish. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So that was my, that was my go-to for my, for my, for my fish meals. Gotcha. Oh yeah. Right. Cause you're doing, all, uh, I mean, everything pretty much just eating fish the whole time. And, and what were you stopping in, uh, you know, kind of, uh, every, every month or something like that? Yeah. Oh, more often than that. Um, yeah. I would, I'd usually be in one place for a week at a time. And then I'd, I'd move to another area and, uh, you know, through all my contacts from the many years at Orvis, um, you know, I knew a lot of guides and outfitters and lodges and stuff. So I could touch base with them and say, I'm going to be there in three, in your mm, area right. about three weeks. And, um, yeah. they'd usually hook me up with something. And, um, so I, yeah, it was, you know, it was, um, it was actually a, a somewhat social time that way because I, I was able to drop in and see, fair number of people that I'd met through the years. Well, I wanted to touch, you know, before we start to think about getting out of here, uh, you know, obviously your sons, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that, who's taken over, because you were, you know, the president for a while there. And then um, do you have two sons or maybe talk about your family who's running the show now? Yeah, I have two sons, Simon and Charlie. Um, Simon's, I think, 
I'm, I'm going to be within a year of this. They're 38 and 35. Mm -hmm. um, and then my brother's oldest daughter, Hannah, who I'm guessing is probably 33, 32. Um, all three of them are working there. Day, uh, Simon is the president. Charlie is um, um, a strategist in the men's merchandising area. He's been in, a, like we do with all the family members, try to try to get them in a lot of different parts of the business so they can, you know, they can understand mm -hmm. it holistically. And Hannah is in um, women's barrel product design. Mm -hmm. um, um, and it's really exciting. I love, love talking to him. But one thing I learned from, from um, working with my dad for so many years is that you want to be real careful. Um, be clear which hat you're wearing when you're, when you're talking to your, your family who is in the same business. Are you wearing your business hat or are you wearing All your right. family hat? They, they, they need right. to be distinct. <laughs> yeah. So you have to cut it. You, you have to make the break when you're, when you're I, at home. I, or, yeah. 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 I often, I've, I used to go through the formality of saying, Hey, I got my business hat on now. Um, yep. and now, uh, <laughs> Now we have a different thing. When they're, when they're talking business, they refer to me as Perk and not Dad. And when they're talking to me as um, as Dad, family, they refer to me as Pablo. The, oh, there you go. Yeah. You go, so Pablo, you, awesome. you know you know by which name they're using, which 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 hat they got on. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. OPST's Micro Series has been designed to pleasantly accommodate both single hand and two handed waterborne casts. Sporting single weld upper grips, switch style lower handles, a medium fast action, and a short length that makes almost anything possible. Uh, I've been swinging flies for trout with this uh, this lovely rod uh, with the micro series lately, and it's been really amazing. In fact, um, on my last dry fly trip, I actually put the uh, Skagit line away, grabbed an old reel with a five weight line. Uh, I think it was a weight forward line. Tossed that on this rod and it casted. Uh, how did it cast? It was like a dream. Um, lots of power and a super delicate touch. It kind of feels like this rod pretty much does it all. So, um, so this is pretty amazing stuff. Whether you are swinging soft tackles, throwing heavy articulated streamers, or busting bushy salmon flies into the teeth of an afternoon breeze, these nifty little hybrid rods should have a permanent place in your quiver. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to get it started right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash OPST. Okay, let's get back to the show. And so how do they, I mean, you're on the board, right? Are you still the, um, are you kind of the uh, leading the board there or what are, you, what are you doing? You know, we did an interesting thing. I'm not, I'm no longer the chair of the board. Um, we wanted our independent board members to be really more assertive, um, especially after Dave and I had retired. And so we made changes. So we have all non-family members chairing the board as well mm -hmm. as the committees. Um, and Dave and I serve on the committees, but, um, and it's really worked out well. Of course, it, it helps Simon and Charlie and Hannah. They're, you know, they're not sort of reporting to their parents. Um, and, uh, I, and the board has been like super more engaged since we made that change. They've been really, really strong. We've had, mm -hmm. We got three women on the board, um, three independent women on the board and, and um, three independent um, male members of the board and um, hmm. it's uh, it's a real strong group of people amazing was that um, was that hard when you made the transition kind of slowly I don't know if it was slow or fast but out from president over and kind of out of the company to, to hand it I mean I guess you had a lot of good people so maybe it wasn't that hard but what was that transition like well, that was one of the reasons I did the sabbatical. I wanted to test my ability to separate from the company because I'd worked there 40 years and, and run it for 25 years. And I wanted to know if, if there was mm. life beyond Orvis. Um, and, uh, of course, living on a bonefish machine, mm. it's pretty easy to find a life outside of, outside of the business side of Orvis. Um, so that was past that test. And then also wanted to test the succession um, within the business um, in terms of, you know, how, how it functioned without, without me there. Um, amazingly, it functioned very well. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, just joking. Yeah. Um, so um, it, no, it wasn't hard just because I, you know, my activities in, in the outdoors and conservation are so absorbing that it was very easy for me to 
changed my main energy outlet from Orvis business to, you know, the more recreational, more customer side of the business, really. Um, well, I'm curious, you know, this is kind of bigger picture. And now that you're out of it, you probably maybe don't think as much of the, about this. But, you know, you've were Or- Orvis is gone, right? You think back to you when your dad took over. Uh, and then you got in there in 77, then you move it into 92 where you're running the show. And now with your kids, I mean, where do you see Orvis going, say in the next 20, 30 years? Do, do you guys, are you looking out and think about, because it seems like you're just leading in so many places. I, I wonder how you, you know, keep improving. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a definite campaign on now and they're, they're getting traction on to, to simplify the business. Um, you know, over, over both my dad's tenure and my own, you know, and I think when you're running the company, it's a little easier to run with your ideas. Well, we ran with a lot of ideas over the years and the business got for its size, got very complex. And we, you know, we really fully appreciated that in this last transition of leadership that, um, you know, it's one thing to have sort of run, run the business for 25 years and grow into the new, the different, the new additions to it. It's another thing to sort of step into something that complex. So I would say one thing that will, you'll probably continue to see is, or, and if you look carefully is some simplification of the business. We used to own a boot and bag, uh, factory yeah. in Missouri uh, called Goki, um, and we've sold that. Um, uh, and we've got some other um, ways of simplifying simplifying the business we're mm-hmm. working on. So I think you know um, focusing more um, is probably. I mean, you may have been looking for an answer like a thousand stores and a billion no, dollars I in wasn't. sales. No, 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 you, no. This is no. I think I think yeah, I think it's more. Um, certainly maintaining the values that have been, um, I think, so strong in the business, largely because of, I think, its family orientation is a key part of going forward. Um, and running the business based on its values um, as much as anything else, I think, is is going to continue to be a strong focus. Um, and then, um, you know, some simplification and trying to be better at fewer things. That's right. Yeah, it sounds. No, I love that answer. And the simplif- simplifying it seems like it would be challenging because you have so many, you know, you're in so many areas doing well, you know, with the gear, the rods. I think I asked Tom what, you know, Orvis does best. And I think he might have said the rods, right? But that's just one thing. You, you do a lot of things pretty well and supporting local. And, and, you know, this has come up a number of times on other podcasts with the, the other companies, right? You got Sages, the Sims, all these big companies out there that are um, you know, I guess people talk about like they, they had a lot of money infused into these companies compared to some of the really small little companies going out there. I mean, how do you just, you know, again, as we start to wrap this up, how do how have you guys competed with them? Or do you even think about that? You just do your own thing and you kind of do what Orvis does best. Um, oh, let's see how to answer that. Jeff, there's, well, That's there's kind of a big one. The, no, there's there's definitely competition. Um and it sounds like such a platitude to say it's friendly competition. Um, right. But it, but it is. Um, but it's also real competition. So Casey Walsh, you know, was the, is the leader of Sims and has been for a long time. And Casey and I were board, fellow board members on Trout Unlimited way back when. And, and you may have heard my dad passed away a week Mm. ago. And, you know, Casey was one of the first people to write me and send his condolences and stuff, but we're, but we're, but we're very strong competitors as well. Um, So, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah. There's some, there's, you know, you you help people where you can, where it sort of doesn't get in the way of your competition and then other places, yeah, you're competing vigorously. You're competing. Exactly. And that's what, like you said, you got the Sims and, it seems like a lot of uh, some of the other companies have a focus, you know, like Sims obviously has waiters, you know, you got the sages, but, but you guys are focused on, like you said, this talking about simplifying. I mean, you're great at, you've got these rods, you've got spay rods, you've got, um, you know, it seems like you're a little bit into everything. It, simplifying seems like a challenge to me. I mean, I, I guess I'd love to talk to your sons about this to see how they get to that point, but do you have an idea how you what you cut out moving forward? <sighs> 
and uh, it and it might be easier to answer by saying what we what we focus on and then other yeah. things kind of maybe fall away so when we think of our fly fishing business we think of rods reels wading gear lines leaders um, and bags those are and the, you know yes flies yes yes lots of other things but in terms yeah. of what what we really focus the time on those are those are the product categories that um, that we put our our energy into, and that that helps simplify. You know, that's mm -hmm. those are the positions we hire around um, that we structure around, um, and so and similarly with apparel, you know, we we identify the categories of merchandise that we want to be great at, and we we focus on those, and then the others kind of fall away. That's right. Yeah. And in apparel, and when you said those six things or, or whatever it was, apparel wasn't really in there, right? Is that kind of, that's more of a second tier uh, piece of the business? Well, we think of it as a, as a, a different category of business. So there's, we, we, oh, right. we think of the business in terms of we got, we got fly fishing, we have wing shooting, men's apparel, women's apparel, gotcha. and, the, and then the, the dog category. Um, and yeah. so we have leaders in each one of those um, major categories. And then within that, they focus on the sort of subcategories that they really want to be dominant in. Gotcha. Okay. All right, Perk. Well, uh, just a couple of quick ones before we get you out of here. Um, and you, you mentioned the wing shooting. I mean, I think that's a really interesting piece too, because it, obviously I think a lot of fishermen, fly fishermen are into hunting and uh, I've done a little bit of shooting. I'm not great at it, but for you, you know, you have to choose between fly fishing and wing shooting what, for the rest of your life. Which one are you going with? Oh, fly fishing. Bob, wait, wait a minute. I got I got I got I got I to gotta look around, see if my dogs are listening. My bird dogs. Oh, right. <laughs> no, they're all, That's right. they're all out of the room. I can say that. Um, That's right. What what, what do you got there? My, what are your what my, breed dogs? Um, I got three English pointers and one Brittany and then a lab. And um, yeah. and they they pretty much own my calendar from mid September to um, mid December. Um, yeah. Fly fish, fly fishing definitely comes secondary and only because of the dogs. Um, yeah, they own, the, they own the calendar then. That's right. That's amazing. Yeah. The dogs is a kind of this cool thing and hunting. Typically it's just you, you're a hunter out there maybe with your group, but with dogs, right. It's this whole nother thing in hunting. Does it seem, is that what it is? Is that, is it the dogs? I mean, when it comes for, down to it. Yeah. For me it is. If, yeah, if I didn't have the dogs, I wouldn't hunt. And if my dogs, if my dog's injured, I don't hunt. You know, if I, if I don't have a dog to go with, unless I have a, you know, a friend who's got a dog um, yeah. who I'm going with, but, um, That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I asked my son. You know, he was uh, Simon was a um, uh, um, bird hunting guide and a fly fishing mm. guide in Montana for about eight or nine years. And um, I asked him. I said, "So, which of those, you know, um, did you, you know, are you more passionate about?" And he surprised me when he said um, the wing shooting, because I would have guessed mm. it would have been the fly fishing. And he said, "And it's because of the added dimension of the dog. You, you in both of them, you have the client, you have the quarry, you know, you have the resource." Um, and, and you have the, you know, and, but when you add the element of the dog, um, which you're so dependent on, um, and you have to have an important relationship with, he says that extra complexity said really that that's what made it even more absorbing than the fly fishing guiding, but that's it. I thought that was interesting. Very telling. Nice. And, and what about you might, I mean, you're out of the loop a little bit, but I'm just curious on resources, you know, uh, you guys have, Orvis has the fly fishing, you know, the whole section on videos and teaching is what other resource other than Orvis would you recommend if somebody wanted to learn about fly fishing? Would you point somebody, Any, anything come to mind? What would you tell us if somebody asked you that? Well, the, uh, I think there are numerous um, great guides who are great teaching guides. And you really mm -hmm. would, we don't categorize them in, in our endorsed um, programs. And we probably should. We probably should have a category for teaching guides, though it's very subjective. Right. But I think, I think um, finding a good teaching guide and booking days with him or her um, is a great way to learn and, uh, mm -hmm. very entertaining. And, uh, but yeah. it, but, but not all guides are great teachers. And, uh, those no. that are, are, um, are superb. That's right. Yeah. I, I wasn't, I always loved, I joke a little bit about, but I guided a little bit and yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't like it that much and I wasn't a great teacher. And maybe that's the reason why, but I've heard people mention that a few times on this where, you know, they talk about themselves as a teacher, not really a guide. 
and it, I think it makes sense because yeah, you should be, there's more than just, you know, catching fish. So obviously that's a big one. Um, so Perk, what, one last random one here, uh, music. I, we, we all, I love to ask the music question. Do you have a like favorite band or type of music you love to listen to? You know, I was, um, it's an interesting question because I think I heard someone ask my son once, what, what music does your dad listen to? And you know, it's a tough oh, yeah. question. It's a tough question. Cause yeah. I thought, I thought, how would I answer that? Um, <laughs> No, I've always been interested in the singer songwriters, um, uh -huh. you know, from from my kind of, you know, I grew up with Bob Dylan, basically. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, not literally, though, he and I were both born in Hibbing, Minnesota. Oh, wow. he didn't, we didn't go to, you know, we didn't go to preschool together. But um, no, I was I was I'm of that era. So I'm still yeah. very attracted to the, the singer songwriters. Yep. And, Definitely. Um, Bob Dylan. Yep. I'll put a, we've got a little link going at uh, wetflyswing.com slash music where I create a Spotify channel. I'm putting a, a singer or a song from each of our guests from now. So we'll, we'll add some Bob Dylan in there and then people can listen to a little bit of that mix. But um, Well, I can, I can tie those um, last two questions together um, about teaching guides and music. Um, okay. We, we lost two of the great teaching guides in the last six months. One was Paul Roos out of Lincoln, Montana, who had lived quite full life. He still died young for who he was. He was 78, but one mm -hmm. of the great, great teaching guides. And then yesterday I was at the service of a wonderful 38 year old guide. He'd won the one fly as a guide and then he'd started the Jackson hole fly fishing school. His name was Spencer Morton. And Spencer passed away a week ago from a heart complication, which was just tragic. Um, mm -hmm. And at his service, which was, it was pretty cool because you know how busy it is this year with guides. Um, there were probably 300 people there and I'd say a hundred of them were guides who had obviously told their clients, sorry, can't, can't guide you today. I'm going to the yeah. service. Um, wow. But the, um, the song that they played um, was, you may know it, This River. Oh, this river. Do you know this river? No, no. Who's that? By? Um, I, I'm not sure. Oh, uh, the artist is. Um, mm, I'm it, spacing I, on I, it. I, but, uh, I can yeah. look it up. Yeah, it's it's oh, it's it's soulful. It's very soulful. Is that like? It's probably like I'm I'm guessing kind of country. Uh... Oh, JJ Gray. Oh, yeah, JJ Gray. Gray. I got it. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Yep, this river. Yeah, I see him. He's he's pounding out a ballad here on the video. Okay. I'll, I'll add that to our queue and uh, and try to find some information on on those folks. I haven't heard, I haven't heard about. Uh, I, mean, I guess I've heard of Paul, but yeah, I'll I'll try to dig into that a little bit. All right, Perk. Well, that's all we have. I'll let you get out of here in the next uh, say six months to a year. Anything new you got coming now that now that you're you know I guess retired? How does all that look for you? Any, any big trips or what do you do with your time now? Um. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are probably saying the same thing. I really enjoyed, I mean, I love traveling. You're going to see exciting people, great places, stuff like that. But I really enjoyed just being here and feeling the rhythm of the seasons change and seeing the subtleties of day to day in the same place. And even though I didn't get to see my friends, you know, anywhere near as much. So I actually hope to to travel um, about half as much as I Mm -hmm. had before and uh that'll be a challenge um there you go but i yeah i've got a within about two and a half hours drive from where i'm sitting right now i've really got some of the best fly fishing in the world and so right. you know why get on a plane that's right yeah you're in uh you're in wyoming right yeah, I'm in Jackson, so I've got you know great waters in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, you know, all around me. Um and uh, I just go through a lot of good tires on my forerunner. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, Perk. Well, I'll leave it at that. And uh, I'll send everybody to Orvis.com and let them connect with Tom and the crew. And if they have a specific question, I'll just direct them through Tom. And, uh, and yeah, this has been amazing. I, uh, like I said, I, you know, we've had a connection with Orvis since my very beginning. So it's really cool to have you on here and hear a little bit of the story and just say thanks for everything you've done over the years. I definitely appreciate it. And I know a lot of our listeners do as well. So yeah, we'll keep in touch with you. Sure. Love to stay in touch with you and your listeners. So thanks for having me. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes and all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 225. That's 225. 
We're testing a new feature uh, in the paid members program we have going. Um, if you want to get ad-free content, uh, episodes just like this, but without ads, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash members. That's M-E-M-B-E-R-S. And you can test it out for a quick free trial there. Um, see what you think. See if it's helpful. Um, that's a new thing we got going right now. So check it out if you get a chance. I want to give a heads up uh, for you to tune in next Tuesday morning when Justin Spence uh, is here from uh, Big Sky Anglers. He breaks down a little on Montana fly fishing with the focus on the West Yellowstone area. <clears throat> so Justin's back for his second time on the show. This is going to be a real good one. So hope you can join us uh, next Tuesday. That's it. That is a wrap. That's all I got for you today. I hope you're having a great day wherever you are right now, whether you're driving, running, walking, or flying, or fishing maybe. I um, want to say thanks for your support and uh, looking forward to staying in touch with you. I hope to maybe catch you uh, on the river sometime soon or maybe online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.